because it's the five of us here, why don't we make this more of just a conversation of us answering your questions? Okay. So we'll just start off with telling a little bit more about ourselves, and I'll start. Okay. Uh, my name is Alisa Lewis. I'm an animator, recruiter, and consultant. I've been in the television industry for about 10 years, um, most notable for my last five years on FX's series Archer. I um, have worked with Asifa Atlanta, one of the largest animation societies in the Southeast, and uh, now I run my own company, My Animation Life. I do animation resourcing and staffing, so I match artists with clients. And on the resourcing side, I've made the largest animation map, calendar, and classified ad for our region. And they're all free. You can go online to myanimationlife.com and um, get access to every animation studio. Now, you're saying animation, why does that matter? Because interactive is what we consider animation as well. So you can find interactive studios or game studios on our map. My name is Kelly Marble. Um, I started off working with Banda Coders. It's a small dev shop based out of Dunwoody with two offices in Buenos Aires and Toronto. I oversaw their girls initiative, putting girls into technology by creating um, mobile apps with social initiative impact. Through that, I had executive women speak to the girls, and through those connections, it kind of bred me into my new role now at TAG. Um, so at TAG, I'm responsible for our C-level engagement, so I speak a lot and work a lot with our um, Georgia's technology, small business of Fortune 10 companies. I'm doing round tables and panelist discussions. So we do have conversations about staffing. We do have conversations about where the industry is going. Um, in part to that, I'm also working with our hackathons, Hack as a Service. So we do a lot with developers and gamers solving social initiatives for um, organizations and also universities. Um, great thing that you mentioned Tech Square Labs because TAG has about 34 societies, and one of those is the one that I'm over, which is entrepreneurs. And we have a lot of different um, luncheons that, are, that <coughs> occur monthly, and we talk about you know, how can we really bring creative talent to Georgia? How can we drive t uh, talent to Georgia and make Georgia the top five tech state, or um, the top five state for tech and technology? So um, that's, that's a great point that you um, brought up about Tech Square Labs. And I work with our professional members, and we have about 30,000 members, and they always are seeking new opportunities and ways to enhance their skill set, to improve their, um, their, their performance, whether it's they want to leap from one industry to the next, or if they want to grow in their industry. So that's what I do. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to read off the description of this panel, just to help us remember what the topic is. Um, if at any point you want to get off topic, it's totally fine. I just want to remind you why we're here. As the economy continues to rebound, prospects for employment are the highest they've been in over a decade, and company efforts to retain top talent are taking priority. Learn how to avoid costly employer mistakes and foster lasting employee satisfaction at all levels of your business. Finding good help on a tight budget can seem next to impossible, but you've got more, at, you've got more in your reach than just those in your friends list. Uncover resources and underutilized strategies in hiring, developing, and retaining top talent. So I know you mentioned about you have members at Tech Square Labs who are looking to um, work with different companies and really figuring out you know, how can um, they get into this industry or break into it. I would say Tech Square Labs is a membership organization, is yes. that? Uh huh. Or like for the tech startup. Uh huh. So it's mostly the companies that want to meet saying, hey, I'm trying to find people who are like doing <coughs> the normal like, you know, job sites, hypothesis blog, like angels list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and we see that a lot, and we totally see that a lot. I know um, one thing, the biggest differentiator that I've noticed is hackathon seems to be a middle ground for top talent and then also industries. You have a lot of companies that go, I call it um, scouting. So they go to these hackathon kickoffs, and they see that all of these developers, all these engineers are there doing work pro bono. Well, I mean, they get a grand prize, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's really pro bono work. Um, and they're able to talk to these engineers and developers one on one and get to see what they've done in the past. You know, how many hackathons have they done? And these hackathons are 
are MVPs, minimal viable products, or they can be proof of concept. So you can make them live and really integrate them within the organization um, platforms. So really, I think hackathons and then um, these kickoff events are a great way for companies to see the skills that entrepreneurs have in a very kind of relaxed environment. I know ATV, Atlanta Tech Village, they host, I believe it's on Wednesday night, um, it's like an entrepreneur night, and they also do um, career fairs, but it's not considered a career fair. It's more so, um, they tell you to come dress as you are, and it's a conversation between um, recruiters, a conversation between companies, and a conversation between potential prospects. And it's all about engaging that person in just a personal level of, is there some similar, similar interests there? Um, and then General Assembly, have you guys heard of Fuck Up Nights? <laughs> so it's, it's hosted by Tim, I don't know his last name, sorry guys, it's hosted by Tim, and you get the most amazing panelists, like Ann Kramer, this, uh, you know, um, the Atlanta, the City of Atlanta um, Parks and Recreational Executive Director, or Executive Director of um, Economic Development, and they tell, tell you about their fuck ups. They tell you about what they do wrong, you know, how they overcame it, and how can you prepare to move on to that next level. So you get a lot of people who are just starting off in their career there. And so if, if, you're, if you're a staff, a staffing agency looking for entry levels, those are the type of events I go to. Or even if you are someone who are like, hey, I'm thinking about switching jobs, but you know, how was this person able to move or pivot? It's a great way to kind of get their insight because they are already at a point or a spot that you might potentially want to be at. So I, I would recommend, you know, your fuck up nights. I recommend um, ATV and then um, the garage. You know about the garage. Tech Square yeah. Labs, you guys are having Atlanta startup battle. Yeah, we got a ton of events. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think these are the best opportunities where those conversations happen more casually. Um, I don't know if, if you can kind of tie in on what you guys are looking for when it comes to prospects or, you know, how do you kind of find them. I think that would be a good um, tie-in, too. So I do a lot of different things to get uh, – talent into our database. We rely heavily on top talent being available and being affordable and being willing to do whatever project that's put in front of them. Uh, so I get up going to a lot of conventions. Uh, you've heard of Dragon Con and Momo Con and all the little conventions that are around. I go to those um, with my like book bag and it's full of information flyers and business cards. And one at a time, I go from booth to booth to booth to booth of artists and have a conversation with them. Uh, I like to do that on Thursdays or Fridays or Sundays when they're least busy. Saturday is the worst day because there's so much crowd and they want to get money and they don't want to talk to you. Uh, I make sure to get their card and to mark on it what their specialties are and um, if they're willing to relocate and how far outside of their skill set they're uh, willing to go. Based on our conversation, I'm getting an idea of their personality and I make little notes of that. Obviously not when they're watching. I don't make. <laughs> <laughs> like, like this I person think, was an asshole. <laughs> yeah, too shy or whatever. Uh, and then I go back and I fill it in a database. And that's probably the most grueling part is to go in and look at people's portfolios and to start cataloging people. And then my own personal rating system on how well they do in each category. Uh, and then it goes into following up with them, sending an email, and saying, hey, it was great meeting you, whatever. Uh, because at the end of the day, people want to work for people that they like. So you could find top talent, but if they don't like you or the experience they had with your company or your brand, then they're still not going to do the work. Um, so I make sure to send the follow-up email. Um, if I end up friending them on Facebook, which isn't that often unless they're really, really talented, uh, try to remember when their birthday is and say happy birthday and that kind of stuff. Um, because the second I do need to contact them about a client, they usually don't have like a whole week to think about it or tell me like a month down the road if they'll be available. Like I need to know right now. Um, do you want to do this job? Will you take this amount of money? And um, whatever the specifics are of the job, 
So they have to have like some sort of positive rapport that they'll, they'll feel comfortable with doing it. Uh, if you're not gonna go to conventions, what you can do is have them come to you. Uh, when they come to you, you're gonna get uh, the most desperate people. Because people who are super talented, they're used to having offers and they don't have to do a lot of work. Uh, but if you're ever in a pinch, those desperate people will like say yes and churn out work for you. Uh, so I have a button on my page where you can sign up. So you can sign up on the database. And then I have people who will go out and say like, oh, you can sign up here or sign up there. And I go to different event pages and different group pages online. Like if you have a Facebook group or meetup group and I think I can get talent from you for a particular project I know is coming up, uh, then I'll go on your page and say something to the effect uh, of that'll, I'll say something that matches whatever your group does, but also makes you think about what I do and makes you want to come back. So I'll say, oh, on the My Animation Life page, um, there's such and such a thing that relates to this. Did anyone see it? Or there's free tickets here or something that's going to get people to say, okay, this seems awesome. Let's sign up. Um, and I'll say the, the way I get the strongest people is by doing what I'm doing right now, which is sitting on a panel and talking. Because I'll meet someone who's like, I know she can talk in front of people. I'm actually scouting for a speaker next week. So going to events like this, I can say, OK, well, this person, I've seen them talk to people. I've seen their work. They obviously uh, have a portfolio that's strong enough for them to be at a convention. Or I'll meet someone in the audience who does the 3D scanning and say, oh, Actually, I'm working on a project for 3D scanning, but you probably wouldn't talk to me if I were sitting in the back row over there. But if I were sitting up here, more likely to. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good stuff. And I, um, are you guys familiar with any of the immersive boot camps and coding camps in Georgia, like your General Assembly, Tech Talent South, um, Digital Craft? So I know a lot of hiring agencies pull from these schools too. So when you're um, you know, developing a skill or if you're saying, hey, I want to go back to you know, do UX design or some type of um, technology, new technology that you want, a lot of these boot camps, they have career fairs. And we're not talking about career fairs from like your service providers to vendors. We're talking about career fairs like your turners to, you know, your CNN, well, that's the same thing. Your turners to like your HD supplies, your Rollins, and so forth. So I know that um, not necessarily if you wanted to learn a new skill set, but if you wanted to be a part of that community and plugged in, you know, joining their, their networks, going to their meetups, going to their um, kickoff events, their special mixers that they have, just being in those communities and in those pockets, that's a really good way to be seen for others to say, man, I, you know, I heard about Greg, you know, he keeps popping up and he's, he's showing me his portfolio and then they can refer you to someone or they'll hire you. So I think it's, it's I think Atlanta's makeup is a lot different than a lot of other places. I think we're more network base on how you get jobs and how someone kind of pivots versus just, you know, having a LinkedIn page and sending your resume and, and trying to say, hey, you know, I want to connect with you because I see that you're the hiring recruiter for, um, you know, Fox News or et cetera. Um, so I don't know if you guys had any personal experiences where you went to a networking event and maybe you didn't get the job, but you had someone who was great for that job and you referred them or you recommended them. Um, is there any experiences that you guys might have had? I had a cool experience with a hackathon yesterday. I was in the stage of C hackathon hackathon. Yeah. I'm happy and I'm like, yeah, this was the first time I worked with MapQuest. I'm like, they're going to love your project, so they're probably going to want to hire you. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's how it happens. That's really how it happens. They get to see your skills. They see, I think hackathons is, is such a great way for staffing companies to see how people work because you're working in teams, you have a tight deadline, you know, you're working against X amount of teams to get a prize that you don't know if you're going to win or not. So it's almost like, you know, it's, it's, this, it's this pull of, man, this person is dedicated even though they're not getting paid. And so someone sees that drive and they see that motive and that force. And if it's for a cause, they see that you have passion behind it. So they know that if they bring you on to their company, they can really keep you and keep that talent. Um, so if you've never done a hackathon, I know I did my first one last year with the Weather Channel and Google. It was an eye-opening experience. The judges 
CIO from Weather Channel, CMO from American Red Cross, Red Cross Cancer, Red Cross? No, Ameri what is it? Red Cross? American Red Cross. That's what it's called, yeah, American Red Cross. And it was another, um, another panelist. And I can tell you, I was the only black female there. And um, I was a UX designer, and I did um, something with Project uh, Visio, something like that. But the CEO of the Weather Channel came up to me and said, hey, we need more women like you. You know, continue to do what you're doing. And just from those small little interactions and those touch points, I think you can start developing those relationships with the people that can make that career move for you. So um, I, I, I'm a believer in hackathons wholeheartedly. Yeah. Any other questions or, or experiences when it comes to staffing or when it comes to um, the industry or and don't think of staffing as like you have to have an agency. Anytime you are pooling people together for a project or you're recommending people, you're essentially staffing. That's true. Yeah, I was good to hear all this. Definitely been dabbling in all these different methods. So again, we can start with speedups. Um I I mainly know speed ups like that's well off, so hmm. I agree. Um, I know. Were you about to say something? I was going to say, I know um, when I was working with Band of Coders and I needed volunteers to teach um, girls how to code, I would go to meetups and I would find freelancers and I would find people who have been in the industry for long periods of time willing to dedicate their time to come and teach girls how to code. So when you mention how, you know, there's a spectrum of levels um, depending on where they are, that is true. And meetups is a great way to start those and bridge those connections with people. Even if they're not a staffing agency, you can build a community of um, like-minded individuals, and you guys can kind of work together and say, "Hey, you know, I'm not really fit for this position, but I think you would be," and send it their way. So it, it definitely builds that community. So I worked with I worked with Girl Develop It, Women Who Code, and I, I worked with um, Band of Coders Girls Academy. Girls Who Code, my former coworker, Christina, she was the lead there for General Assembly um, in the Atlanta for GE in Atlanta and also in Seattle. But um, me individually I have not worked with them. I only know about the great work that they've done. Well, see me afterwards, because we can definitely talk, and, and if you need any volunteers or any plugs, we can, we can talk about that for sure. Christina, uh-huh, Christina Smith, yeah. In technology, yeah, I am too. I agree, yeah. And if you, if you need any volunteers, Girl Develop It, the Atlanta chapter, is amazing. Yeah, I'm spreading the word, volunteers, any type of community outreach. Uh, so not to 
to uh, diverge too much into you know woman empowerment. We can go back on to staffing <laughs> for sure, but I'm glad that we had that conversation. You know what I was thinking about? One of the challenges I run into sometimes with staffing is when I'm working with someone for the first time on a project. If you guys have ever like tried someone out, you know, you're in a pinch or um, you just have something coming up and you need someone in the skill set. They've talked you up like, oh, I can do it, I'm great. And they showed you your work, you see it, but you've never actually tried them out. Um, that can be a little point of anxiety for me because they're either going to step up to the plate and do an amazing job or they're going to completely flop and I'm going to regret ever reaching out to them. This is a costly mistake because um, before we have any artist start in a project, we pay them at least half up front. So that's at least half of the money that's gone. Um, uh, for our staffing agency, it's like a guaranteed pay. So it doesn't matter if the project gets completed or if the client says, um, you know, here's your final paychecks. Every artist gets paid exactly what they're supposed to get paid when they're supposed to get paid. Um, for me, having an artist uh, come through is essential. So I like to try them out beforehand. And that's in a really small way, like on a small project. And if it's something where they're completely brand new and I just, don't have time to try them out, then I'll have a backup um, set right there. And I told the backup, you're a backup. <laughs> <laughs> I need you on standby, um, which requires more work on my part because instead of just finding that one person that can do the job, I have to find a line of other people who can jump in, say that person um, fall behind, and I have to keep checking up on that person who is um, doing that job. So in that, I, I end up acting like a project manager when you know I normally would like to step back and be like, this project's being done. I check in on the milestones. But now I'm checking in, let me see your progress. And there's been a point where I've had to go to someone's house and been like, well, it's due tomorrow. I need to see your progress right now because I really don't need you to do it last minute. They were doing it last minute, but at least I was right there. And some people work best when you're just sitting with them. Um, so if you're ever in a situation where you're trying someone out and you can, you have the time to, pay them a visit and actually see the work, watch them work because a couple things could be going on and I've seen these things happen before. Either they're waiting to the last minute and they're gonna like push it out and you get what you get or someone else is doing the work and you know, they're just they're not the talent. That's fine, if you're not doing the work, I don't mind um, however you split your payments behind the scenes, but if you're not doing the work, then I can't 100% rely on everything that you say. Uh, I need to have some sort of communication with the artists that they're doing um, work with, or just know that. Uh, so yeah, paying them a visit is a great thing to do. Um, another thing you can do is to have milestones set up, no matter what. Um, there's a project, it has a two day turnaround, it's really short. Why do you need milestones for that? Um, because you need to know the second something goes wrong. You need to know when they run into something and how they fix it. Uh, I was working on a project once and it was in Flash. It's a program we don't use very often. It's super easy. Most students have used it before. Uh, I didn't check up on how it was being done. Just that it was being done. And when the client turned around and said, can we buy out the assets? It was a jumbled mess. Nothing was named correctly. Um, the layers were not put in order. If you know Flash, their symbol sequences, when you go back into it, it was, it was a complete mess. Um, so checking up on your artist, at least in the beginning, and setting a standard, is going to help you if you're working with someone that's brand new. So just to kind of get a feel of the audience, do you have a lot of people kind of searching or seeking jobs or? new kind of industries or is it more so you're in a staffing agency and you're trying to find talent and how to find that talent? I think if you can kind of get a better gauge, we can definitely target. Um, brand spanking new ones. Huh? Um, if you played Legend of Zelda, the first one, I just walked in the cage with an <laughs> old man handing me a wood sword saying, take this. <laughs> That's, that is literally where I am. Okay. And
you're somebody that I would like to bring on to the team and start getting some finances in. They freaked out. They froze. They didn't want to go through with any, when we came to the paperwork part, they didn't want to sign anything. I said, look, you know, we're not signing away your name or anything like that, but I've got to protect myself and i got to protect this company. So, you know, we're at a place where if we start taking money, um, they got to know where that money's going. So we got to get to this point where, you know, if you draw this, this, does this belong to the company? How is this stuff going? They totally backed out. They took everything with them. It just went down. So here I am again, round four, just figuring out, okay, how do I approach people who, they're great, they're good, um, whether they're top of the line or this person is a student. So how do I approach people about this, not scare them away, um, talk to them about round four startup? Are they partnering with you? Are they part of the vision, or do they just have a role where they're fulfilling like a task? Um, first, you know, we started off at Starbucks, just talking. I, I did what you were doing. You know, what do you like to do? Where are you? Can I see some samples of what you got? Do you have a portfolio or something online? Can I see what you do? We kind of did that for a few weeks. They kind of matched. I got them to do a sample. Took the sample to some people. They were in business and that kind of thing. Said, hey, what do you look at? Think about this. They were like, that's awesome. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I don't know who this person is, but hey, you need to hold on to them. So then I gave them you know, part of the vision. I said, I, I want you to be a part of the team. Mm. The I team, think. like the, 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 the mind behind it? Right. So, so like, our, like in the company. So whereas if I was the founder, this person would probably either be co-founder or whatever. And I was looking at that. That that's where we will ultimately wind up, but we're not there yet. This is where I am. We put everything on the table. This is where I am. This is what we've got. What do you think? Like two thumbs up, down with it. I'm a student. I can't do all that stuff anyway. Let's roll. I said, okay, we'll sign this first because no matter what happens, I want to pay you for whatever you're doing right now. Uh, I said, because I, I don't, I don't want to rip you off or anything like that. So we moved in that fashion. But when the papers came out. So looking back, if today that artist came and said, hey, you know what, I'm just here for art. I'll just make art for you. Would you take that artist back and say, you can do the art? Yeah, as long as I can use the art. Yeah, so yeah. You, as long as you had a contract just for the art. I think where you lost them is when you said team. So. Um, when you bring people on for a specific task, like you're asking for a portfolio so they can fill a specific task, they usually just want to focus on that. And the second you say, I want you to be a part of my vision, you're asking them to open up their hearts and to take on something, like a relationship. You're asking for a, a, a big commitment. Um, anytime you're asking for a really big commitment, you're going to have a lot of people who filter out of that. So I would say stick to the small things, get them on the small things. and. Um, People are more likely to stay once they've made a commitment. Uh, I like to use the analogy of dating, where if you, and I'm gonna use this from the woman's perspective, I hate that there's no women here to go, yeah, you're right, girl, <laughs> like in the audience. <laughs> but, um, so when I go on dates, I like for um, us to go to some sort of eatery where they have paid for the meal, and they've paid for something, put in some sort of investment, uh, because I find that if they pay for something, there's more likely to be a good second date. And if we do halvesies, or if I pay for the date, then it's just like, ah, whatever, I can up and leave when I want. But they're like, ah, I've already put good money in on this girl. Um, then they're, they're more likely to stay and to be more gentleman-like. Uh, it's the same thing with artists. So you got them to do that sample. That's one bit of commitment they did. If you lead them in, little by little, having more and more commitments, eventually they'll look back and say, I've invested a lot into this. I'm not going to walk away quickly. So if you do want them to be in the team, keep that on the back burner. First, get them in as your artist. And just say, hey, yeah, your art's really good. You know, I'm getting some backups. Always have backups. Uh, if you have the style sample already, you don't need that artist. You can get another artist who can match that style. Um, all you need is someone who knows other artists or to go to like a convention or something, you find someone who does a style match. Um, and then after they've made a commitment of 
spending a few hours with you, sending you in more artwork that you've paid for, then they'll get invested on their own. Yeah. When I, when I heard it too, I thought that you the vision was premature. Like um, you, you said it too quickly to that person. And so I, I definitely would have agreed that they probably got nervous and kind of backed away. Um, I think, you know, especially approaching someone fresh out of college, you know, they're, they're eager, they're, they're ready, but then when you're saying, hey, I want to bring you on as a team, it's like, oh, this doesn't seem like it's going to be consistent, hey, you know, it, it brings in that, you know, that security net that they're used to and that comfort level that they now have to kind of come out of, and I don't think they're at that maturity level or at that um, level to make that decision straight out of college, so um, I would agree. Yeah, they want stable job and money that's coming in. They want the success. Mm -hmm. I was promised success when I graduate. Yeah. <laughs> if they're still in school, yeah. they're waiting. Like, they're definitely in la-la land where they're like, ah, oh, I don't need to get in on a small company with a... And some, you know, some, some students actually create startups together and then they're able to, because they have that, those relationships and that rapport with their students or with their colleagues, and so they feel like a safety net, like what I feel, we're filling together, you know? So they, they kind of build that camaraderie. But as a... Um, you know, as an industry expert, kind of coming in and getting talent, I think you have to d kind of balance that line and kind of dance around it for sure. Is that, yeah. Yeah. Agree. Agree. Yeah, we, we were actually, she, she, she spoke, but it was like a rant, um, a rant panel. And one of the guys who's a director for CNN, he was talking about how a lot of these small um, studios come to him saying, hey, you know, I want to help de develop a game or, hey, I want to help develop something. And he's like, okay, what have you developed? What have you done? And they're like, oh, well, I kind of launched this thing on Kickstarter, but it, it didn't come to fruition or, you know, I didn't complete it. So I totally agree that that leverage point as to, like, yeah, you did a lot in school, but now you can actually work on real world experience. Because this is the thing with, with students. They always say, I can't get a job because they want me to have experience, but I can't get experience unless I get a job. Well, startups is the best place to do it. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead and ask your question. This is no, your, your no, I chance. I, what I was going to ask was, so how long do you think that should go? But you guys just said it. It's a portfolio builder. So however long the project yeah. is going, that's how long you can mm -hmm. yeah. And then they get at the point where you can't pay it again because you've done great work. You know, you're just you know, some money in the deal. Like, like, you know, you're mm -hmm. A great tipping point is waiting for them to interject. When they start giving you ideas and start suggesting things, take it in and say, yeah, okay. So right now you're giving them tasks. You're saying, oh, well, um, can you draw this character? I need to turn around or whatever. They do the turn around, you pay them. Um, you say, okay, great, it's going into this game. You show them a little bit of where it's gone or what it's going into. At some point, they're gonna see something that you don't see, some way to make it better. And then you'll know you have someone that you can count on. If they never give you input on how to improve or never give advice or they just up and go, that's not your team member. Um, but the second they start saying, oh, well, you're using that engine, you'll be faster, or the other guys are tutorial, or the second they say that they have done some sort of research on your behalf when you have not asked them, you're not paying them for it, then you know, okay, you can start slowly bringing them in. At some point, they're going to bulldoze you, and they're going to say, oh, well, I can just do this, or have you thought of that, and go on and on with your conversation. And that's a lot easier to bring them in. But don't say the word team with them until they have, like, proven themselves to you. You can, but I'm going to tell you, just in my experience, those people don't stay. The second they find a better opportunity, they head out. Someone who, you know, is there intellectually and they're like, I can do this job. Sure, yeah, I'll come in as your, your secretary or as your project manager or as your illustrator or whatever. The second they find another job that pays more or whatever, they're gone. But somebody who treats it like this is my family, this is my baby, someone who you've got in their heart, they're going to stay. And um, that's like your friend or somebody who you worked, like they didn't just pop up and all of a sudden their heart's yeah, given yeah, yeah. to you. It's like 
there's, there's something that yeah, there's something that yeah. led up to that. Yeah. yeah like, uh, kind of building on the opposite side, building a relationship with the person. Yeah, I think. And saying, oh, well, this person has all this talent. They actually know about this game engine. That they think about in this project. And I think that's how a lot of startups. Ideas. Yeah. Or found it. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly how it happens. It happens very organically. It happens through through time. And I think that you can have a team and that team kind of be committed. But I would also be wary of uh, what Elise, Alicia, Alisa. Alisa said. <laughs> it's the phenomenon. Well, yeah, I would also be wary of that and, and know that money is is a motive for people you know like you really got to figure out what drives that person what the motives are behind it and that's where you're gonna know if it's if it's gonna last I know like you see a lot of incubators around town you know accelerator programs tech stars um, just it's a numerous amount of them and I think you can look at their their companies those really small companies and see where they are two years from now three years from now do they have the same founders do they have the same you know what is their net income and like are they generating revenue um, I think that would be a really good indicator as to how many companies how many startups are founded and then how many founders kind of shift and move um, I, I would kind of look at it as a case study just to get a general yeah. like option yep what kind of talent Meetups. I would go to meetups. So when you're looking for designers, are you, is that what necessary? Like art designers? Yeah, yeah. I would go to 3D artists. But, but yeah. 3D artists? Like modelers, riggers, and like lighters, or just the modelers? Um, well, we, we have a couple texture artists on staff, like full time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but, but I mean, sometimes we just have to expand because there's enough work where we need to bring on other people. So I did just look at Well, Go ahead. yeah, I was going to say your generics, you know, your, your LinkedIn's. Um, but at, the reason why I said meetups is because meetups is the most um, conversational way to actually figure out what someone's talent is. And there's specific meetups to your needs. I mean, there's meetups, you know, Azure meetup, you know, Microsoft meetup. I mean, very specific ones that you can attend and then start building those reports. So now you have a pipeline instead of just kind of like scouting them out. Now you go to these meetups you're having, you're building relationships. I keep going back to relationships because I think it's such a huge thing in Atlanta. But you're building that pipeline and so if they can't do it, they're gonna recommend someone for you because you guys meet up once a month and he knows that you're cool and you're looking for you know this type of job or this type of skill from someone. So Or go to myanimationlife.com and hit the staffing button. Sign up and automatically we'll put three artists of whatever specific thing you want in front of you. Hey, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that filters out a lot, I'm sure. A it does. Of... Uh, we are traveling all the time. In April, I was at home for four days that entire month because we were just out traveling and scouting and getting the talent and filling up the database. And it's just like the artist. It's completely free for them to sign up. All they need to do is say, "Hey, I'm available. I'm open to doing um, contract work." We put them in our database. We have their skill set, we've done all the mapping and rating and all that kind of stuff. And then when you say, I have a project, maybe I haven't talked to this person in a while or whatever, I just say, hey, uh, so I have this project, uh, your portfolio is a match for it, uh, how much would you charge to do this? So I'll get a quote for you if you need a quote. Um, if you have a price range, I'll tell them the price range, say, will you work for this price range, at this timeline, this exact type of style or whatever, if you give me something that has like your IP on it, then we'll have them sign your contract, your like non-disclosure or whatever. And then they give us the information, we put three artists that match that one skill set you have that you're looking for, and then you choose your primary and then your backup. Backup in case, you know, God forbid something's to happen to them. Then we sign a contract on it and milestones are agreed on and go ahead with the project. It re the employer, like if you were to contract, it really depends on your budget. So if you were to say, I have a big budget, then you're going to get big time artists. If you say I have a small budget, like super small budget, then you may just get the person who's still in school. So 
so it really depends. We try not to turn people away, but if you are saying like, I have absolutely no money, then we have a classified section where you can post your job and then anyone who just wants to do a job can grab it. I make my money off the top, so as a project manager. So it's like, um, we have a project, and then we decide how much the artist wants to get paid, and then how much of the budget, how much time I'm gonna spend on the project, if I'm gonna be the one or another staffer is going to. So like mm hmm yeah. And remember, we try not to turn people away, we try to work with your budget, just know that you get what you pay for. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> So, um, are there any other questions or, uh, how, like, I'm really interested in feedback um, when it comes to this panel and if it was helpful, insightful, um, any new knowledge that was learned or things that you, you can say, hey, well, I really thought you guys were going to kind of skim over here or, hey, you know, this is some things that I've learned to let me share it. Um, so, I'm, I'm really very <laughs> dialogue based. Oh, yeah. So I love free stuff. Um, <laughs> Google has been my best friend. Um, it's what we run our map through, our classified ads, and um, our calendar. We run it through Google because it's shareable, really easy. I can give you a link or tell you to go to my animation live page. You can download that map, like on my phone right now. Let me show you real time. Double tap, put in my code, go to my map on Google. It loads, <laughs> and then I go to like my maps. I take out this address to here because I came here. All you do is go to your places. After I've like saved my maps, I can go to the animation map, which also interactive is animation. I can see where we are and where every single studio in the state of Georgia is. Every resource center, every place. Um, that houses animators for like support, etc. And I can share that and you can save it on your phone. When it comes to like staffing, I definitely need to use something that's shareable because I'm working with other staffers. I use the Excel like thing, the spreadsheet, and um, the form. So if you were to bring people in on your form, what you need to do is go to Google Forms and start typing in the most important information. And it's going to take you a while because I had to map out on paper what do clients normally look for. There's what I had in my head of what I want to know, and then there's what clients are always asking, um, and merge those two things together. And it turns out to be like this form that's quick for them to fill out, but long for you to create. But once you have it, um, you sync it to a spreadsheet. Like you just go to, you've used it before, you go to the other tab, sync it to a, a spreadsheet, and then on that spreadsheet, sign up for alerts. That's the biggest thing. Say alert me when someone fills it out, and then you can, um, you know, filter through whatever talent you have. There's another organization called Risley, which we're gonna start using, and it will allow you to put like videos and stuff up. So now we can turn it over to the clients and say pick um, through these artists, and then um, get back to me with whatever number code they have. The reason why um, we use codes instead of names, that kind of stuff, and why I'm leaning towards Risley is because we have an um, anti-discrimination clause when it comes to our artists. So the client and the artist don't know who each other are until the contract is being written. Um, artists sign up, I know who they are, I know their physical ability, their backgrounds, I know everything about them. Um, but when we show their work to a client, we don't want the client to know about that and have that like color their judgment. So using Risley, you can do that. You can go on there, upload the person's work, and then just have codes for the artist, and then they'll go back to that. That's a lot faster. It just takes a lot longer to set up. And we have close to 2,000 artists. So it's, it's gonna take a while to switch over to that system. But in turn. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So it's called a bag. I'm just kidding. <laughs> what do you do when you get a business card? Okay, like I get this business card 
from Miss Kelly Marble. <laughs> Immediately. I mean, I love your name. That's awesome. <laughs> Immediately, I go home. I say, Kelly Marble. She's with Tech. Yes, but I also have notes on what Kelly has talked about. I send Kelly an email. It's like, oh, Kelly, blah, 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 blah. That email is part of your database. Um, Kelly emails me back and forth. Now I have our correspondence set up. And then I go into like the regular generic sign up. If during our correspondence she says, I want to be added to our database, I go ahead and I add it into the database without her ever signing up on the form. And um, then when I need someone in that skill set, I can go to the database, yes, but then I also can go to the email, and the email will tell me a lot more. It'll tell me about her personality, is she having a baby right now, did her dad just die, et cetera. Some real world experiences there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can have a board, too. I love boards. Uh, you know the Google circles in yeah. the Google Plus, the circles? I have circles at home. Uh, it's not a circle shape anymore. Uh, but you just put um, their main skill set and, like you put the tag there, like Kelly tag. I have a tag circle because there's a bunch of tag people, but it's a big group of people who do um, behind the scenes event coordination, speaking things, anything in leadership, and I tag it there. And that way, when I walk by, like I walk by my house, I go by that wall, I remember the people who are there. That'll help. Which one? Oh, where you take a picture of the. That helps. Is it? Yeah. It helps because when you're on the run, like right now this event, you could say, what's that card for Jimmy or whatever? What's his email? You could do that. My only issue with it is that it's small. You're only seeing a few at a time. And when I need something and I need it fast, like a client goes, I need it in two hours, I need to go to this wall and be like, that is him or whatever. I know we use, um, with business cards, there's a thing called ScanX, where you can scan the card in, and then it feeds into like a, a, a database, I think it's Access or something like that. And then from that, you can um, easily search for like Control F, who you're looking for, and different organizations. And then uh, we have interns who then input the cards into Excel spreadsheets also. So I don't think there's, I haven't found out an easier way to do cards just as yet. I know back in the day, I think two years ago, they had the QR code where you scan it, but I, that didn't take off at all. So uh, <laughs> I think we're still trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. So you're new. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What brings you to this panel? Uh, I came to this panel because I am trying to start my own company. So it, it definitely requires bringing in some good time. <laughs> yeah, we see that a lot. Um, where you have an idea and you have a product and you want to, to have a team built around it. We were just talking to this gentleman here about how to onboard um, new talent, whether it's uh, they have expert skill set or it's just fresh. So um, some of the takeaways we just we were discussing was uh, that vision that you have of starting a team to kind of start it small and, and try, try to build that person's portfolio if they're if they're new. So if they're a, a student, to say, hey, you know, these are some products you can work on to build your portfolio for another um, another company, or if you wanted to keep them as you know, bring them on like a co. Um, co-founder, it's kind of one of those things where you just make smaller changes and make smaller commitments with that person um, to eventually arrive to that point where they're like, man, I've been working on this, you know, on this game or on this uh, platform for two years, or et cetera, and um, I'm ready to make that jump. And we also talked about the reverse. So if you go to these meetup groups or if you go to um, these networking events and you just kind of organically start forming those relationships, how down the line it can form into, oh man, let's start this, this company. And you have two, two visions, two ideas that kind of come and form one. So just get you up to speed. But, um, Let me see how we are on time. We have four minutes. Okay. Awesome. We have four minutes. Any questions that you just have 
to have answered. I mean, you guys are taking your time out. Go ahead. What was your, uh, your outsourcing My animation life, or Mao for short. Life? Mm hmm. Life. L I F E. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lisp. <laughs> Anyone have anything that you want to have answered? Think about the sacrifice you're making to come here. Get your answers. <laughs> anything in the animation pipeline, whether it be storyboarding, scripting, voice acting, um, character designing. Most of the people on our staff, um, our staff data, or our database, artist database, are non-technical. We do have people who can code because sometimes we need you to code if you're doing an interactive kind of animation. Um, but yeah, the majority of people are not tech people, unless you count the fact that they can use the software to get their job done. <laughs> Yes, of course. So uh, I have these information cards, and I think I have enough for the amount of people in here. <laughs> Just kidding, I have two. <laughs> I had, I've had events every single day this week, and I'm down to these two. But I have a bunch of business cards. Um, basically, it outlines every single artist that we staff for in the animation pipeline. I'll just go over it for the people who are not going to get one of these. Um, <laughs> Okay, pre-production artists, concept artists, character designers, environmental and sound designers, storyboarders, and script writers. Production artists are animators, which is stop motion, traditional, 2D, 3D, motion graphic, experimental, and interactive, which we also call um, the game people. Illustrators, background painters, and voice actors. For post-production, we do um, editors, vis effects artists, and compositors. And for support staff, we have producers, project managers, directors, programmers, accountants, and lawyers. Good pipeline. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I don't have a staffing agency, so uh, <laughs> all I can recommend is networking events to go to and attend to kind of build that pipeline out. And so I know TAG, again, we have over 34 societies. One is our um, entertainment and media, which we're having our summit coming up October 11th. And this is a really good one because we have a lot of great panelists that are in the gaming industry speaking. And so just being around industry experts, subject matter experts, and like-minded individuals would probably be a good place to kind of start if you want to build that pipeline or just start those conversations. I guess for my closing thoughts, I'm going to say the best way to get people is to get them to come to you and not the other way around. That people will work harder for you, they'll stay longer for you, and they'll be more passionate if you get them to come to you. Um, one way that you know I put a big star by is by doing panels, um, doing talks, starting your own club, um, doing something where you have asserted yourself above the crowd and now everyone else needs to flock. Um, if you join an organization, always join with a title. Don't just be a member join the board. Um, if you are going to start your own club, um, you know, you can start out small, that's fine. Go ahead, get the momentum going. And then once you expand, change your role from being the person who is doing so much to the person who's coordinating more. It's gonna take you a little bit away from your passion, but it's gonna get the right people in front of you. Yeah, and a way to join those boards, again, tag, we have 34 societies and all of them have board members and have board chairs except for mine, which is entrepreneurs, because we don't like to be governed. But for all the other ones, uh, you can definitely, if, if you're a member, if you're thinking about joining a board to kind of get that information and kind of build that pipeline, I definitely recommend TAG. When you come a member of TAG, you're available to all of our offerings and a lot of different programs that we have. Um, so we put on networking events, we put on mixers from all industries. So whether that's if you have a passion for gaming and design, if you have a passion for um, infrastructure, transportation, um, we bring in leading industry experts, sea levels to kind of tell you where that industry is headed, go to market strategies, um, 
we put you in a, a place where you can talk to someone next to you and they have direct information that you may need at that pertinent time or at that given time. Um, another thing about TAG is that um, it's like a two level. So you have members and you have sponsors. And a lot of our members are then invited by our sponsors to go to some of these events, like our exclusive events. Um, like the ones I host is like our CIO roundtable, for instance. And you have 15 CIOs from a different spectrum of of companies, um, from your small industries to your Fortune tens, and it's literally one CIO to three people. So it could be two session sponsors and one member, or et cetera. And so you really get to interact and pick their brain and have those conversations and those one-on-one -on -one discussions. Um, so I, I think the the benefit of being TAG is the um, the network capabilities and the way you can leverage it. So, yeah. But I, I enjoyed this panel and. You guys were amazing. <laughs> I know we're, we're a small group here, but I, I think this is very insightful, and I'm glad that you guys gave us feedback and we were able to have that open dialogue, for sure, for sure. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.